Today, the uh, lectionary passage is uh, somewhat long, John chapter 4, and we addressed that chapter when we did our series last fall on, on worship, and so uh, it's some uh, 45 verses, and so I decided not to read the entire thing, but we recognize that it's the story of the Jesus encounter with the woman at the well. He needed to go through Samaria, came to the well, was thirsty. At that time, a lady came to her, and uh, she was coming at the time of the day, with it, which would indicate that she had a quote-unquote reputation. Jesus asked her for a drink of water, and uh, she wonders why a Jew would be asking her for that. Jesus answered in verse 10, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink. You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. That, of course, intrigues her. Jesus explains, everyone, in verse 13, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. Or she... Once that water explains that, Jesus says, go, go get your husband. <clears throat> well, of course, she had been married five times, and the person she was living with was not her husband. And so she recognized Jesus as a prophet. And uh, then we have a whole conversation about uh, ancestors. She's describing her ancestors wor worshipped on this mountain. But uh, you say that the place of worship is Jerusalem, and this uh, brings in this conversation where Jesus said to her in verse 21, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And so she recognized that the Messiah is coming. Jesus lets her know that that is he. And uh, <clears throat> so Jesus sends her back to her people. She really becomes... Uh, a very unlikely evangelist, and yet it impacts uh, this whole village. While the, uh, the disciples had been off to getting food, and when they come back, um, <clears throat> we read this. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. This is verse 31. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely... No one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. So the story continues to unfold from there. Today we're going to read just the prayer itself. Matthew chapter 6 verses 9 to 13. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. Let's pray together. Lord, we once again come to familiar words. Words that we have said, shared often. Lord, we pray that we can uh, once again be have a heightened awareness of your presence during this time, your spirit will work in our hearts so that as we as we discuss and reflect on these words that we can be reminded of the uh, of the treasure that you have provided for us 
Lord, enable our hearts to be quickened, our minds open, that we might not only hear your word, but to leave this place to do your word. To your glory and honor, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. As we uh, come to this section in the, uh, in the Lord's Prayer, we recognize that there are <clears throat> some transitions taking place. The prayer begins sort of like with the majestic, and then it will move toward of, sort of to the Monday elements of daily bread. And so that's sort of a, a transition there. Whether the bread is from Hy-Vee or whether if you're in Pella from Yarsen's Bakery, whether it's from Panera, wherever, <clears throat> it focuses on the stuff like bread. It's also a focus from focusing on God to our daily needs. Now, before we look at the, this phrase in a little deeper way, it's important to note that later on in this chapter, Jesus tied this, these two elements together. Hear what he says, beginning of verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to the span of your life? Why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I tell you that even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? Or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all of these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God. His righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. <clears throat> so Jesus begins his prayer to focus on God. First of all, the focus on he's our father, a loving, caring father. Then moves to the image of him being a king. King who oversees the kingdom of God or ushered in the kingdom of God. And then he moves to personal needs. Give us. Now, so often our prayers begin there. Give us or give me. But we know prayer should begin with God. To begin with God with adoration for him, acknowledging him that he is the source of everything, acknowledging him that he loves us dearly, he cares for us intimately, he knows the details of each one of our lives. An amazing God who is omnipresent, everywhere present, all-knowing, indeed, and all-powerful. Prayer should begin with God and his kingdom's will because everything else depends on these matters. If we put God first and his kingdom's purposes first, everything else falls in order. If not, our life and universe tend to get out of order. Now we have to be careful not to sort of build a whole theology around simply the context or the order of the sentences in the Lord's Prayer. Nonetheless, there is surely some significance in this particular order. Prayer begins with our relationship with God, as we noted earlier. It begins with hallowing His name, honoring His name, seeing just who He is as God. So it concerns itself very early on with the importance of God, the importance of his kingdom, the importance of seeking 
his kingdom and his will. But it doesn't postpone our human needs, our simple reoccurring day by day needs to the end. We find it right here in the middle of this prayer. So while the daily needs of life should never constitute all of prayer, or shouldn't be the primary beginning of prayer, they warrant God's attention. I appreciate the way someone said, if something concerns you, it concerns God. If something concerns you, it concerns God. If something is a part of life as we live it, it ought to be part of our prayers, whether the prayer is for blessing or for correction. All of life rightly falls within the province of God. We know that sometimes we may fear that our very human material needs are too commonplace to be brought to God. But Jesus, however, in this prayer, taught us to pray for something as routine and as mundane as our daily bread. Think how often food in general and bread in particular were issues of Jesus' life. We recognize that after he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, after his baptism, where God had clearly said, you are my son, you are my beloved, of whom I am well pleased. And then the Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted. And after being tempted there for 40 days, what does, Jesus, what does Satan tempt him with? To turn stones into bread, daily bread. His most notable miracle, short of raising Lazarus from the dead, was taking bread, breaking it, and feeding the multitudes, which he did different times. 5,000 here, 4,000 here. And those were just the men in the group. Remember the road to Emmaus after Jesus' resurrection. They didn't recognize him. But yet, when they came and they stopped, it was in the breaking of the bread together that they recognized who Jesus was. With the heritage of a first century working class home, surely Jesus wouldn't give us a prayer that, omit, that omitted the needs, the daily needs of these lives. And I don't know about you, I'm glad about that. Because as Helmut Thielich, great theologian, said, 90% of life consists of trivialities. The Lord's Prayer could not be a great prayer if it didn't concern itself with the trivial concerns that make up every day. Life is great, beautiful, noble, but it is made up of thousands of common, ordinary, everyday details. If something concerns you, it concerns God. Whatever our need is, whether it's physical, whether it's emotional, whether it's a spiritual, whether it's relational, God notes as we look at the passage later on in that chapter that if we, if we will depend on him, if we will seek him, he will provide those needs. And so it's appropriate for us to say, give us this day our daily bread. Provide for us these, the needs that we have. Paul would sort of, certainly build on that in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Do not worry about anything, but in everything. Let your request be made known unto God with thanksgiving, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds. Christ Jesus. Now what's interesting is the Greek word in our New Testament that we translate as daily is a word that until only a few decades ago could not be found in any other Greek source except here in Matthew. And so many assumed that Matthew had coined that particular word. 
since it was not used anywhere else. <clears throat> and Origen, one of the early Christian fathers, said that Matthew invented the word. But in the 20th century, scholars came upon this word in some ancient papyrus. And the word was found in a fragment of what? What do you what do you think or where do you think this word was found in? What kind of writing was this found in? Anybody have a guess? A woman's shopping list. Okay? And so some have looked at this that particular and and feel that perhaps the best translation would be give us this day our bread for tomorrow. But it still speaks to our daily common needs. We're thankful that God knows our needs. And so when we bring him to him, it's not as if he's go, oh man, I didn't know that. And yet, in prayer, what we see is sort of the the aspect that God still invites us, still wants us to ask for those things, even though he knows our needs. Even as we sang a little bit ago, you know, the seek ye first the kingdom of God, ask and you shall receive, as Jesus said, seek and you'll find, knock and the door will be opened unto you. Because in a certain way, God still <clears throat> wants us to acknowledge our need before him. And that is in his providence the way he will respond to those needs. We might not have a deep appreciation for something like bread. We might get a text from a spouse, bring bread, and pick it up from work. And we know that our, our, anxiety, our anxiety is not whether we'll be able to afford it, but are we going to get the right kind of bread? That's what I'm always concerned about, you know? I can't remember if she wants whole wheat, does she want cracked wheat, does she want dry, does... And so often I will text back because I want to know exactly. I mean, because it's not just the kind. Do you want Sarah Lee? Do you want Hybe? You know, all those different things. But <clears throat> even in that, bread may not seem like such a gift if we earn our daily bread with our muscle, the back, arms, and yet we must confess that even our muscles, even though our, our gifts that we have given have been given to us by our Creator. Maybe we earn the ability to buy bread from our creative thoughts, our minds, but surely God has given those to us as well. Even if we insist that we're a self-made man or a self-made woman and are proud of our determination and energy and drive. Well, we know these attributes had to come from somewhere. They didn't just pop out of the air. Whether they're part of our genetic code or proud of, of our upbringing or the influence of some teacher or employer, we can thank God that we possess such a gift. So ultimately, all is a gift. And we acknowledge, even as we move to offering a little bit later, that everything ultimately begot, <clears throat> belongs to God. And yet, he wants us to ask him for it. And in the asking, we're recognizing, hopefully, when we do that, that he is the source of everything. If something concerns you, if something concerns me, it concerns God. Whatever our need is, whether it's physical, emotional, relational, spiritual, we know that God will take care of it. Maybe not in our, our timing, but in his timing and in his way if we depend on him. Give us this day our daily bread. We may have our physical needs met, but 
these passages remind us that life is more than food. As Jesus responds to the tempter in the wilderness, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds from the mouth of God. When he says that, he recognizes and he is telling us that God's word is something that feeds us. We have physical needs, but we do have key spiritual needs. And he's given us his word because his word will help guide us. His word will help us against temptation. His word will help us fulfill our purpose in life. We read earlier as well, Jesus said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. And so Jesus wants us to acknowledge our daily needs. But he also wants us to see that our needs are beyond that and realize our greater purpose in life. But the food of the soul, the food of deep satisfaction, is to do our Creator's will. Let us pray together. Lord God, we, we come to you. We're thankful that you are concerned about the details of our lives. We're thankful that you have called us to bring anything and everything to you. Lord, we pray that our lives can be a life of prayer, sort of an ongoing conversation with you, wherever we're at, whatever we're doing, so that in the midst of our daily routine, we can fulfill your calling and your purpose. Lord, we come to you and, and we pray for those for whom bread is literally what will mean life or death. And we pray for those, even right now, who are desperately hungry. We're thankful, too, for our loaves and fishes in our food bank, as well as the various food banks in this city, which provide some of these things. We know, however, they provide much more. As one person said, not everybody who comes really needs the food, but they deeply want to see the smiles and feel the hugs. Lord, help us to continue to, as your people, reach out and through us reach those who desperately need to know your love and grace. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.